Hello, welcome everyone to our uh, third session of this lecture series. I'm here as usual, just for a, a minute or two, introducing Massimo Riva, although Massimo Riva is known to many of you because he's a sort of standing key figure for the University of Modena, for our department. Um, he is professor and chair of Italian studies uh, and director of the virtual humanities lab at Brown University. He's also affiliated professor of modern culture and media, so uh, involving all these skills. His teaching ranges from Boccaccio's De Cameron to modern and contemporary literature, film, media, and digital humanities. He has held visiting positions at the University of Modena, the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico, the University of uh, London, the Ecole des Hautes Études in Paris, University of Sydney, Australia. Um, in recognition of his research-based teaching, he was nominated Royce Family Professor of a teaching excellence. His awards and honours also include the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic with the rank of Ufficiale for his contribution to the dissemination of Italian culture in North America. He's been teaching there um, for most of his career. Um, uh, he has published several books on literary maladies and national identity, post-humanism and the hyper novel and literature in the digital age is the editor of the Yale anthology Italian Tales and co-editor of the Cambridge edition of Pico della Mirandola's Oration on Human Dignity. That's why he's a special friend to Modena. <laughs> he was the recipient <laughs> of three major grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities and Digital Innovation Fellowship from the American Council of Learned Society in support of various digital projects, now part of the Virtual Humanities Lab that he's director of. Um, among his recent collaborative initiatives, a series of interactive installations of the Garibaldi moving panorama were featured in libraries and museums in Brazil, in Italy and in the UK. He is currently completing a digital monograph entitled Italian Shadows, the Curious History of Virtual Reality, a pilot project of the Brown Digital Publications Initiative funded by a grant of the Andrew Mellon Foundation to be published in 2021 by Stanford University Press. And we're looking forward to um, his presentation, his talk today. Thank you very much, Massimo. Um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you, Marina. Thank you very much. And, you know, it is a real pleasure to be virtually with you in Modena. Uh, and I hope uh, that uh, we can repeat this uh, in real life, uh, perhaps in the summer. Uh, uh, my presentation today, in fact, uh, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, uh, my presentation today is based uh, on my work in progress on the digital monograph that you just mentioned and uh, uh, is an ideal continuation of the lecture uh, that I presented last uh, year in person uh, at the summer school. And I'm going to share my screen uh, and see whether this is happening. Uh, can you see my slideshow? Yes. You can see it. Great, great. So for the past uh, few years, four years as a matter of fact, I've been involved in an experiment, as Marina just mentioned, with a new form of digital publication, a digital monograph, uh, which is the translation uh, into a digital environment of what used to be uh, the traditional physical support of a scholarly monograph, the printed book. And here are some of the properties uh, that a digital monograph as a born digital uh, scholarly long form and uh, born digital form of publication uh, should possess. It should be fully interactive and searchable online with primary sources and other works, portable across reader applications, capable of supporting metrics of use that respect user privacy. This is, you know, of course, a very important issue uh, nowadays. Uh, maintained and preserved 
in its digital form and preservation is another crucial um, aspect of uh, uh, digital publication. Uh, economically sustainable, uh, both in terms of production and in terms of um, <clears throat> availability, high quality as judged by peers, so no different than uh, uh, traditional forms of publication, peer reviewed, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, the digital monograph I've been uh, um, working on with a team of uh, digital librarians, designers uh, uh, at uh, the Brown University Library, and now to be completed by December 31st and published next year at some point by Stanford University Press, uh, is not necessarily a narrative genre. Um, uh, yet a narrative dimension is also part of its discursive strategy. Um, and this is a little bit of the topic uh, that I'm going to focus on in, in this uh, conversation. So within the contemporary multimedia publishing environment uh, made possible by the internet and other forms of digital communication, also uh, the scholarly monograph becomes to some extent a type of transmedia storytelling. My monograph uh, consists uh, in six case studies and here um, these are screenshots from uh, the uh, the actual uh, monograph that I'm going to show you live um, later. Um, the it consists in six case histories or um, uh, epistemological tales, as I call them. So each case study uh, is uh, focused on an analog optical device that foreshadows uh, fundamental features of our contemporary digital culture. So the Mondo Nuovo or Pantoscope, uh, uh, the Camera Obscura, uh, the polemoscope and the magic lantern, uh, the phantasmagoria, the moving panorama, and the stereoscope. So the main themes of the monograph are virtual travel or virtual mobility and what I call social voyeurism, uh, best exemplified by our social media platforms. And both are essential dimensions of the perceptual and cognitive virtual realism that pervades modern popular culture and or techno culture and informs the genealogy of what I call the modern panoptic self. So this is a sort of a general description of the monograph. Uh, so all the objects and devices that are the protagonists of uh, the epistemological tales or case studies are in fact virtualizing machines that simulate and model the world they represent. So they are analog machines, of course, but they are they, they possess this uh, uh, ability to produce a, a virtual or simulated uh, version of the world. Most importantly, these devices belong to a peculiar dimension of pre-digital popular culture in which experimental science, technology, and artistic practices converge or intersect to produce hybrid, immersive, quote unquote, immersive experiences that, as I mentioned earlier, foreshadows, foreshadow those afforded today by digital apparatuses, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, extended reality, and so on and so forth. The overall design of my project, and here we get to the specific uh, feature or uh, features of this digital publication, is inspired by one of these devices, a magnificent exemplar of Venetian Cosmorama or Mondo Nuovo, shaped as a teatro all'italiana, recently uh, discovered in the game room of a historic Venetian country villa. I was uh, uh, present at the unveiling of uh, uh, 
this uh, artifact in the Museum of Pre-Cinema in Padua that, uh, 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 you know, houses uh, the uh, Zotti Minici collection. And I shot this short video. Uh, and so uh, it's a very amateurish video, uh, but it can give you an idea of, uh, of this device and how we work. Basically, you looked inside this, uh, this Mondo Nuovo and what you saw uh, was a kind of three-dimensional landscape uh, uh, enhanced by a system of lenses uh, and also uh, lighting features. So uh, one fundamental idea uh, drives both the design and the narrative or my main argument of my digital uh, monograph uh, simulation as the mirroring effect between form and content. And this is really the central uh, concept that I will uh, uh, sort of focus on you know, throughout this lecture. This is best exemplified by our uh, simulation of the Mondo Nuovo or Pantoscope. So we built a 3D model of the uh, Mondo Nuovo. Uh, for the monograph that provides an ideal container for the interactive simulations of the other devices as illustrated by this short video. And I hope uh, now I can These are all uh, um, animations from the simulations and uh, we'll take a look uh, at some of them later uh, during the presentation. It just, just give, gives an idea of uh, how we uh, created uh, this resource for the uh, digital monograph. Okay, um, so choosing simulation as both the narrative thread and the epistemological principle or framework, as well as the main design idea for the monograph is entirely consistent with the possibilities offered by the digital publishing platform. And thus in its design, uh, digital, I mean, Italian shadows, and, digital design mirrors to some degree the characteristics of the devices it studies as the virtual jacket of the book uh, uh, its landing page uh, shows let me now move to the uh, actual landing page of the um, the monograph the Interactive digital simulations replace what in a print format we could call illustrations and are meant to both demonstrate how these analog devices worked and allow the reader to experience, quote unquote, their performative, perceptual and cognitive effects, something clearly impossible to realize in the printed format. And let me go back to my presentation. So 
So each tale of <clears throat> Italian shadows provides both a reproduction and an interpretation of its virtual object. Uh, through the windows open within its pages, quote unquote, the reader of Italian shadows will be able to explore virtually uh, digital versions of the artifacts that are the objects of the case studies. For example, explore Gian Domenico Tiepolo's painting known as Il Mondo Nuovo, play with a 3D version of a Mondo Nuovo, enter virtually uh, an oversized camera obscura called the casotto, <laughs> inside which one could look at the reflection of the world outside uh, in the 18th century Venice. Uh, the reader will be able to experience the devious properties of a spyglass known as a polemoscope uh, at the center of a play of the same title written by Giacomo Casanova and travel to the bottom of the ocean in a magic lantern shadow play uh, illustrating Casanova's sci-fi novel Icosameron. Here you see uh, our team at work with the creation of the simulation uh, based on the animation and the shadow play that we recreated thanks with the to the contribution of an, an Italian artist. Uh, and here is uh, some of the slides created. We have no illustration of the Icosameron, so we sort of illustrated the, the book uh, with uh, uh, a magic lantern show. Uh, the reader of Italian Shadows will be able to visit a 3D reconstruction of the legendary 1821 exhibit of Pharaoh Seti I's tomb at Egyptian Hall in London as conceived by the Paduan amateur uh, field archaeologist and showman uh, Giambattista Belzoni and travel with uh, the uh, Italian national hero Garibaldi uh, on his Sicilian expedition in 1860 through an English moving panorama from the same year. And finally, our reader will be able to take a stereoscopic mini grand tour of Southern Italy, Naples and Sicily in particular, based on Rome, Naples and Sicily, based on a kit from the turn of the 20th century. And this is what I like now to concentrate on, to give you an example of the transition from uh, a very interesting uh, digital I mean, uh, analog uh, uh, publishing uh, format to uh, our digital format. Uh, the mirroring effect that I mentioned before between form and content, that is the uh, overarching uh, design idea behind Italian shadows, uh, is perhaps best exemplified by the last case study of the monograph um, or epistemological tale of the monograph, uh, which is focused on an underwood and underwood stereoscopic kit. Dating from the 1890s, this kit contains in what looks from the outside like a book, as you can see here, a viewing and reading apparatus of a different kind. Uh, one which allows the readers, users, travelers, to travel virtually uh, in space and time and have the illusion of being actually transported elsewhere, not only in their mind, but through their perception. Stereoscopic kits uh, inaugurate a new stage in the evolution of virtual travel, which is the central topic of my uh, curious history of virtual reality. From map to tour, to quote Michel de Certeau. Uh, so it is not difficult to see how the words of one of the spokesperson of the Underwood and Underwood uh, uh, firm, Albert Osborne, foreshadow the subsequent evolution of virtual tourism and the attraction of popular gadgets that combine a screen, an image interface, and unlimited access to information, all embedded within a geolocation network. The experience is that of being in the place itself, rather than an experience of being in our home, seeing a picture of the place. 
What Osborne was promoting in the early 20th century, indeed what he was marketing uh, for as a spokesperson for Underwood and Underwood, uh, a firm that was founded by two brothers from Kansas uh, in the heartland of America, is an early form of what has become common for us today uh, when our quote unquote experience of the world is thoroughly filtered uh, through the devices that convey it. Osborne's approach was also part of a deliberate strategy to sell a product. The Underwood and Underwood kits, uh, complete with the special maps and books forming a travel system, as they called it, a patented travel system. Uh, the world in a box for the benefit of uh, the American innocent at home, to paraphrase Mark Twain's famous uh, Innocent Abroad um, collection of uh, travel pieces. The panoptic character of virtual tourism is clear from its very early stages, embedded in all the gadgets or devices I mentioned, uh, the object of my monograph, Mondi Nuovi, Cosmoramas, Panoramas, they are all convey a virtual traveling experience. With the stereoscope, however, virtual travel reaches a new level. Uh, representational techniques change in a technological way, which is functional to the new cognitive forms that imperialism and or cosmopolitanism require from ever larger masses of people in an age in which the nationalization of the masses is also part of a broader globalization. And as you can read here, the, from every home, classroom, and student's room to the most important, interesting, and fascinating places throughout the world. In short, the Underwood and Underwood travel system is a real precursor of Google Maps and Google Earth. As the subtitle of uh, uh, Osborne's book suggests, the individual development uh, provided by stereoscopic kids is also, quote, a promise for the spread of civilization, American civilization, that is. This is indeed a recipe for the Americanization already in progress, of which the Underwood and Underwood travel system uh, which peddles virtual travel as a form of democratic voyeurism is a perfect example. Everybody should have access to these gadgets. Other gadgets, boxes, and other systems will come along to provide the same panoptic and voyeuristic illusion. As Wendell Holmes, the inventor of the portable stereoscope, prophetically wrote in 1859, I quote, the time will come when a man who wishes to see any object, natural or artificial, will go to the imperial, national or city library and call for its skin photograph or form the stereographs as he would for a book at any common library." End quote. From this point of view, the stereoscope exemplifies the relationship between its specific goals of the promotion of virtual tourism and the general organization of knowledge and also a kind of design for uh, um, a, you know, a publishing system. Holmes Library is also a kind of cosmorama. A century and a half later, the world in a box, of course, resides in uh, everyone's handheld devices distributed through uh, social networks that condition and filter the wish to see any object natural and or artificial, which uh, Holmes uh, spoke in the mid 19th century. Yet access to knowledge or information is still filtered through popular vision technologies. As Brooke Bliss uh, writes, ideas of an infinite visual library, complete film and comprehensive catalog of images are all forms of a fantasy that accompany the very idea of representation. Uh, so the, she calls a database imagination, which is a kind of, you know, anticipated, you know, foreshadowed again by the stereographic imagination. 
that would presume the world exists as information, appearing as patterns of data and algorithms that can be recorded and processed as such from analog to digital uh, um, means. Um, today, virtual tourism is an emerging industry based on a combination of new networked uh, virtual reality tools, immersive quote unquote tools and social media complete with algorithms and artificial intelligence tools that cater to each of us individually. Stereoscopic travel kits from uh, such late 19th and early 20th century firms as, I, as Underwood or Keystone already provided a prototype of this experience in a comprehensive fashion. By the way, the current pandemic seems to have uh, accelerated this trend, uh, like many other visualization trends, including the virtualization of the academic lecture that you know, we're experiencing right now. Uh, so what was initially conceived as a marketing tool for a real life travel experience has become, has become increasingly an end product, uh, travel replacement rather than travel enhancement. enhancement. So in a way, uh, our monograph uh, translates from the analog onto the digital apparatus, the modular reading configured by the strat uh, stereoscopic travel kit. Also, stereogra stereographic kits fostered a cognitive leap based on map, image, or postcard text combination. As I was saying, our simulation is largely based on this Underwood and Underwood kit, Italy through the stereoscope, first published in 1897 and then re edited several times afterward. And it appears from the outside like a leather uh, bound book, yet as explained, uh, as I explained before, it contains a complex viewing reading apparatus of a different kind. So the, the set of stereographs, 100 usually, the visor, maps specifically designed, uh, as we'll see in a moment, uh, Bedecker, uh, and all together, the instructions, of course, of how to use this system in a coherent way. So users of the Underwood kit could travel first on a printed map that marked the positions from where the views, the double photographs composing each stereograph were taken. To complete the illusion, the guidebook provided an explanation of the view effectively positioned uh, the active viewer inside the image as the result of the double photograph. So the apparatus thus embedded the viewer reader into the image production system and the viewer's experience of actually being there, as Osborne said, was therefore the result of a multimodal cognitive operation triggered by the apparatus. One of the Underwood brothers is portrayed in this picture uh, uh, illustrating how the virtual kit should be used. Uh, his finger is pointing to the book, is reading a, a, a the book, which is the Bedecker, the guidebook, uh, and a map of Rome is open. You cannot see it, but uh, there is a map, uh, is open uh, beneath it. Behind him, the library shows the entire collection of different tours from around the world. So you could travel to Italy without leaving your living room, like uh, you can do today on the internet. Uh, and in this particular case, these kits, such as, for example, roam through the stereoscope, are in essence an exercise in geographical imagination, as Douglas Clark writes in an essay devoted to a close uh, analysis of the virtual experience provided by uh, an Underwood kit of the Eternal City. Five maps were included, I quote, uh, uh, five maps were included in the book, and this possessed the richest nexus of text image relationships for the reader not only had to master map reading or learn how to read the map, but also reading the legend by which things were identified. And everything was, of course, uh, functional to, um, 
to the various components. The maps establish, again, the specific point of view of the stereographs, representing, I quote, the topological relationship between the viewer and the subjects inside a larger spatial context, like a Google map viewer. Once they have established their position on the map and oriented themselves, the travelers, readers, travelers, can proceed to the street view of the stereographs. And the various chapters of the guidebook are organized and numbered, as you can see here, according uh, to the positions of the camera from where the photographs were taken, which combined produce each stereographic view. Our, and here you see the map with the, you know, the uh, positions and the, uh, you know, the, the field of vision clearly uh, indicated and which corresponds to the various description through a numbering system uh, and an explanation system uh, to the uh, sections of the, of the guidebook. So our interactive simulation synthesizes to some extent this multi-model configuration, gathering all the elements within a single window on a Unity platform and showing how the parallel operation of reading, operations of reading, mapping, and viewing are combined in what amounts to a cognitive and perceptual surrogate for an individually customized traveling experience. Uh, Complementing each other, the visual and verbal components of the virtual travel set produce a sort of transmedia auto-narrative experience culminating in the visual immersion provided by peering into the stereoscope. So the simulation, the digital simulation, assemble all the different operations into uh, an interactive, uh, um, um, a series of interactive operations. Of course, uh, this is simulating uh, the, uh, the apparatus, the analog apparatus. So let's go back to the previous slide for a specific example. Uh, what of our position here? We read in the text corresponding to this position. We are so we are actually supposedly uh, somewhere positioned somewhere here. Okay, position six. I don't know if you can see, but... And this is the stereograph corresponding to the position. We are standing on a fairly high house top. And this is a, a quote huh, from, the, uh, from the guidebook, just to give you an example of how this works and how the writing uh, synthesized some of the um, uh, components of this travel system. As can be seen by comparing our elevation with those five story houses to the left of us, supposedly. Just beyond these houses, we, can, we catch a glimpse of the southern row of the colonnade, but only that part of it which is straight. Uh, essential for both the perspective and the characterization of this view is also the figure in the foreground. Uh, the description of this figure is worth reading. We are glad, uh, Ellis, which is the author of the guidebook writes, we are glad to see this sun blackened young Roman laundress, a very type of the land in her striking a picturesque costume. So on the one hand, this figure uh, helps us uh, experience or have the experience of being there looking you know in person at this uh, uh, at this image at the same time it provides an additional let's say a para ethnographic type of information and uh, make the uh, the experience of the place even more effective from this point of view rather than simply a monumental view of uh, of St. Peter's. This is also part, part of uh, my case study. Uh, I go in specifically into this, but I, I won't do this in this in this lecture. But I, you know, let's just read the rest of this of the quotation because it's very interesting also to 
uh, understand what kind of experience was conveyed through this, uh, this uh, system. The white muslin sleeves extend from shoulder to elbow, and some darker materials forms the deep cuff that covers the forearm and constitutes the waist. And could there be anything more light and airy than that unique sunshade which she wears on her head and which falls down over her neck and between her shoulders, thus protecting the back of her head from the fierce rays of the sun, end quote. Not by chance, Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, in his already um, quoted article from 1859 in Atlantic Monthly, called stereographs, sun sculptures, and fossilized shadows. If photography inaugurated a new stage in the realistic virtualization of the world, the painting machinery of the stereoscope, as Holmes called, called it, produces an exchange between physical and perceptual properties. So the reduction of color to form, the chiaroscuro technique in which the sun itself is master, as Holmes writes, is in fact a play of shadows, positive and negative. The stereoscope makes these fossilized shadows tangible, and come to life to some extent. A kind of vibrating spectral life takes shape in front of our eyes uh, as we look through the con uh, contraption. A unique delineation makes of a stereograph a sun sculpture rather than a sun picture as an ordinary photograph is raising the photographic reality effect to a new level. Our simulation emphasizes how, as a multimodal tool, the stereoscopic kit required from the user a series of overlapping visual and cognitive operations, whether mentally traversing the map or using the map while actually in the city of Rome as you know, making the total experience a complex multi-layered one, you know, sometimes uh, some travelers, most equipped ones and most sophisticated one would take the travel system kit with them and sort of find the position where the photograph was taken and, uh, and sort of uh, overimpose <laughs> the virtual uh, room to the actual uh, view of, uh, of Rome they had have, they have in front of them. Standing on the spot from where the photographs of the scene in front of them were taken, virtual tourists were actually in Rome or Venice or could switch from looking at the scene with their naked eye to viewing the same scene through the artificial eye of the stereoscope. What they perceived in this combination of natural and artificial vision was a reality both augmented and substantiated uh, by the apparatus, made more evident and tangible, including their sculptural and shadowy presence like that of our laundress here. So I'm going to switch to the simulation, which is still work in progress, just to show, let's see if I can, uh, uh, to show how in order to remain faithful to the stereoscopic effect within a bi-dimensional container, the Unity uh, window on the screen, uh, uh, here you see how this would actually if this works, let me see. As I said, this is work in progress and we're not quite done with this. These are the instructions about how to use uh, this simulation. Uh, there is a short video introduction. Uh, you can interact with highlighted areas of the simulations so through uh, by clicking on them. You can change the current camera view. You can swap views seen through the stereoscope with main view, select the slides and return uh, to the help screen, which I'm going to do right now. So let's go to our... Uh, <laughs> Let's go to our uh, stereo. So uh, we created the illusion of a three-dimensional space uh, uh, in a bi-dimensional, uh, you know, screen on a big-dimensional screen by using 
uh, individual overlapping layers of two-dimensional art. So the bifocal uh, uh, vision that uh, is behind the, um, the stereoscope is here uh, sort of simulated through, uh, uh, through a technique. And this is one of the, I hope perhaps in the discussion, we can go back to uh, this, you know, this solutions that we find in order to, uh, to provide uh, a simulation uh, that uh, uh, again, combined the different um, operation required by the reader viewer into, uh, you know, uh, uh, an example. Uh, and thanks to digital, to it, an illustration, a demonstration, uh, and also a quote unquote experience, uh, thanks to the digital uh, uh, platform. Uh, so let me go back to my presentation and I don't know how am I doing in terms of time, but uh, uh, approaching our conclusions. Uh, approaching our conclusions in composing my monograph uh, conceived on a digital publishing platform. So trying to exploit uh, the, the features allowed by the digital platform. I was by remaining faithful to this fundamental idea of simulation as that both the subject and the uh, design principle of the, of the uh, monograph. I, I was obliged, I was compelled to shift the weight of my argument from its written to its visual components. Um, uh, so in, in order to rethink conventional illustrations as simulations consistent with the central topic, our simulations are meant to offer an example of how digital tools can enhance a scholarly argument in four ways. They are demonstrative, they demonstrate how those devices worked. Exploratory, they allow the user to interactively explore the mechanism. Performative, they perform a task and deliver a performance uh, shaped on the uh, you know, um, historical examples of performance, Mondo Nuovo tour, a stereoscopic kit, uh, uh, you know, the performance of a play, a painting, and so on and so forth. And they are interpreted. They provide an individual interpretation of a larger category of similar devices and performances. So like the word simulation, also the word performance is used here in two senses. Uh, in the common artistic sense of a musical, theatrical, or cinematic performance, and in a more technical sense, as in how a machine, whether analog or digital, is designed or programmed to perform a certain task. Certain task. All our simulations are thus programmed to provide a digital performance of an analog performance based on the historical record. A virtual version of the kind of performances these popular spectacles made possible uh, so that the reader can perhaps better appreciate their appeal than a verbal description can allow. This also meant uh, investing the written text with a new crucial function based on simulation as an epistemological principle. And here, uh, let me go back for the last time to the, apologize for the phone ringing in the background, if you can hear it, but I'm gonna go back to uh, the, here is the landing page, here is the, the uh, table of contents, here is the first chapter as we go to the chapter. Readers of uh, Italian Shadows have various options. They can read uh, this digital monograph uh, like a web page uh, or, you know, like a book if you wish. Um, and linearly uh, or horizontally as an illustrated book, chapter by chapter, each uh, image will have uh, uh, as, you know, SCADA, you know, uh, uh, 
specific, and this is incomplete, but there will be metadata, there will be links to the sources, there will be links to additional resources, and so on and so forth for each of the illustrations that you see here, uh, citation source files, etc. cetera. Uh, the, the reader uh, will be able to read, as I was saying, uh, the book uh, or like a web page. There are some additional features like uh, captions that can be uh, looked at I or hid or, um, or can be hidden uh, and also translations and the original text, etc. But the, the reader will have also the possibility of uh, uh, exploring more in depth the, uh, you know, the scholarly argument, uh, following its inevitable detours, subplots and forays into the historical archive. So to, to interrupt the, the main narrative, if you wish, and go more in depth, uh, you know, there's a sort of a hypertextual uh, way. We call it further insights. Uh, this is, they are designed uh, to, for a, a specific type of reader, which is the scholarly reader who is interested in the, you know, in the discussion of, uh, of uh, you know, scholarly, uh, uh, scholarly bibliography and so on and so forth. Or the reader, uh, the impatient reader, if you want, or the reader more interested into the narrative, can go uh, back. So, sorry, I'm going to have to go directly to uh, the simulation. And this is how it appears live inside uh, the, um, in the book, let's say. And here, in this case, it's a, a simulation of the Mundo Nuovo. Uh, which is the, uh, the subject of this famous painting by uh, Gian Domenico Tiepolo. There is in-depth analysis and an interpretation of the painting, perhaps a new interpretation of the painting. Uh, you know, readers and, 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 and scholars will judge, uh, which is made possible by, and illust not only illustrated, but also sort of uh, supported by uh, the simulations that we provide here. So our hope is that uh, whatever the reading strategy, uh, the reader uh, of the digital monograph will choose, uh, the fully deployed narrative will enhance the interactive simulations, illustrating their critical goals, as much as the simulations with their interactivity will make the narrative and our argument not only more accessible and clear, but also more compelling. Let me go back once more and for the last time to my, uh, to my slide show. Um, yet we are also aware that a fundamental ontological shift is at work with a transition from an analog to a digital uh, platform. A leap, a uh, cognitive leap, um, perceptual leap already foreshadowed in the stereoscopic kit. Uh, and I read here, uh, this, this is from uh, one of the um, appendices to the, uh, to the guide uh, book uh, included in uh, uh, Italy through the stereoscope, which sort of a, uh, claim, makes some uh, claims for the, how, how much better is uh, and how uh, great innovation is uh, in all this system that is, uh, uh, that is provided. When all is said, we come at reality in books only through interpreted symbols by the power of our imagination and through the illumination afforded by our, our personal experiences. Books cannot furnish us with new perceptions of realities. But even the best pictures we still feel to be but pictures. They do not create the illusions of reality, solidity, depth. The best in this kind are but shadows. But with the stereoscope, the wonder of photography is brought to its culmination. So the transition from a symbolic to a perceptual interpretation of reality, in fact, disguises what in digital culture uh, effectively underlines, underscores visual perception and personal experiences. Code, 
uh, with its unlimited power of manipulation and simulation, and limited in the sense in which Umberto Eco spoke of unlimited semiosis. So our curious history of 3D vision and immersing my curious history of, I say our because it is, as you can imagine, a real collaborative uh, um, you know, effort, endeavor, and which involves uh, many people in addition to, uh, to the uh, author. Uh, the curious history of 3D vision and immersive experiences, uh, which Italian Shadows intends to contribute to, is a long and fascinating one. From Leonardo da Vinci's observations about light bodies and shadows as applied to painting, to uh, Whitson's invention of the stereoscope in the 19th century and Holmes' uh, development of it. So the desire to go deeper into reality and to escape reality altogether has shaped two sides of a unique human experience. So as a digital monograph, Italian Shadows is itself a kind of augmented or extended reality book, uh, if you wish, realizing thanks to uh, our current technologies and aspiration are really clearly expressed in analog uh, uh, systems like the stereoscopic tour of Italy, which is the object of the last chapter. So stereoscopic vision seems to liberate men, humans, from the formal constraints of monocular perspective, while realizing the dream embedded in, uh, in in it of a virtual window and a virtual mirror capable of reflecting the world in all its dimensions. As we have seen, the claim that a new technology is capable of bringing us much closer, more in depth, into reality, into the past, actually, into an understanding of the past, as the effort is here, is not new. However, we should never forget that our cognition of the world, whatever the tools we adopt to view it, represent it, interpret it, is always already a kind of simulation, as Jeremy Lanier reminds us in a book that I suggest, a uh, final suggestion as a reading, uh, perhaps at the dawn of the new everything. Thank you very much. This is the end of my lecture, and I'll be happy to, uh, I'll stop sharing, I'll be happy to, uh, to take questions if, uh, if there are any. Thank you very much, Massimo. Perhaps we might say that I think Massimo is open to questions in Italian as well. Should there be anyone who feels more comfortable with? Prof, c'è l'audio spento. Sorry, I silly me. Um, I meant to say that perhaps students can ask questions in Italian as well if they feel more confident with Italian. I think there have been lots and lots of um, suggestions. Um, I was also saying that. Um, I really appreciated the way, perhaps I'll start with one question and then the, the rest uh, will come. Um, I particularly appreciated the way you developed the contribution of the visual element to argument, a sort of demonstrative, exploratory, performative and interpretive contribution. Um, I wonder, however, a bit provocatively, I wonder uh, how far... Um, <laughs> It seems to be a problem with telephone ringing. Um, the, I wonder how far this depends on the fact that the visual dimension is so central to the object of the study, and the notion of simulation is so central to the, the object of the study. What, what do you think? Does it contribute? I mean, yes, no, I clearly, uh, I was, I chose to uh, to share with you 
the specific, uh, uh, you know, experience that I <laughs> and the work in progress. Uh, um, but, but of course, this is only one example of the many possibilities that uh, a digital monograph uh, as a born digital form um, might have, you know, uh, depending on the subject matter that, you know, in my case, uh, uh, it was almost uh, uh, inevitable since I deal with a sort of a, a media archaeological perspective on visual culture and popular visual culture, etc. It was quite inevitable to uh, to focus on that aspect, and uh, but that was also the challenge. You know? I mean, the challenge is to find the best possible format. Uh, and the best possible use of uh, the tools that uh, digital publishing uh, affords us, uh, affords us to, to, in order to, to specifically adapting them to the subject matter. You know, for other, there are so many different examples of how one can use other uh, feature of, uh, of uh, uh, other digital tools, uh, uh, but. I think this was main, perhaps one of the main things I wanted to emphasize that there should be an effort in designing this new uh, publishing formats to to actually make them coherent. Uh, you know, uh, I spoke of form and content. <laughs> I could have spoken of, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, you know the. The code and underlining, uh, uh, or or again, I could have, uh, you know, I could have tackled this from the different points of view. But I mean, I think, uh, uh, I hope that uh, uh, the the you know the the point that I was trying to make uh, is clear enough. That uh, you know, it's not enough to to uh, it's, if we really want to translate. Uh, the monographic form into a born digital format, we need to make an effort to think, think it through, to think it through from a, also an epistemological point of view. I see there are some chats, but uh, I don't know. I have a question through the chat. I don't know if I can read it uh, from An Angelicia, An Angelicia, from hello from Malaysia. Wow. <laughs> and the question is, would you consider the, what time is it in Malaysia? <laughs> By the way, I have to, I have to ask my students often. I have a student who is taking my class on, uh, on actually conspiracy theory and paranoia in digital culture right now, which is a very hot topic here in the States. Uh, and, uh, and this student is connecting from, uh, from China. So it's, 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 she doesn't sleep at night in order to connect because we are exactly, with, anyway. Uh, so uh, hello from Alicia and Jelicia. And what do you consider digital monograph as a new genre on its own? Or is it a book scholarly work recontextualized by a digital tool? It's 11 p.m. All right, so it's not too, too late. Well, both. I think, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, exactly, I was mentioning that before I was kind of answering that question. You know, each digital monograph uh, um, is a kind of a genre of its own. You know, like uh, uh, every work of uh, digital literature to some extent uh, is uh, a genre of its own. Although we can also talk and Catherine Hales, Kate Hales, have, for example, has written about genres of digital uh, literature of, uh, you know, from hypertext uh, uh, to uh, flash poems and so on and so forth, the evolution. It's, but, but basically uh, every work is a re shuffles, recombines elements of, uh, of and tools of digital to produce, uh, to produce uh, rather something that is standardized to some extent, because uh, we use standard um, tools, you know, the Unity simulations are based on, on a tool that is probably the most um, 
the, the most uh, uh, you know prominent tool in terms of particularly in the area of uh, of um, computer games and so on and so forth or but, but simulation in general a 3d simulation 3d modeling etc um so but so but at the same time uh, you know you need to pay attention to standards because you want uh this uh your your final product your digital uh, monograph to to live on at least uh, you know we live in times of uh, planned obsolescence you know I mean uh, uh, who knows a new version of the unity platform uh, might not allow um, the simulations that we are spending so much time and so much effort to to create to to be accessible and uh, you know browsers uh, might uh, you know uh not allow and so so there are many considerations to be uh, to uh, to be um to be made in terms of uh, the sheer preservation of this um, uh so on the one end yes it's a genre of its own of its own uh, you know digital uh, as a digital monograph italian shadows has some features that uh, are peculiar specifically designed for for it at the same time it has to you know to consider uh, the larger uh, you know context and uh, also the larger the larger technological context in which uh, it is going to be and this is part of the job of the stanford university press you know they will brown will secure the preservation of of, uh, of the digital monograph uh, let's say that in five years uh, the you know browsers have changed to the point that this particular uh, product is not accessible anymore as such we'll have a full documentation uh, in the brown digital uh, repository that will allow to to uh, to access it uh, including you know the softwares that <laughs> that we that you know uh, that we used in order to to produce it another question i don't know if you angelicia if you this <laughs> Magdalena, uh, how many people are involved in the production of such a book? Uh, uh, who has the ultimate control of the final product, the author publishing house? Well, that's a very interesting question because there are three partners in this uh, venture. And the partners are, uh, let's say the author, uh, which should be me. As I say, should be because we'll see in a moment that uh, that's you know is not entirely so. The uh, the team of specialists and uh, including designers, including for instance, the uh, the studio that we hired as an external consultant to create the simulation, and we are working with them. They are of course they are specialists in this kind of uh, of product uh, and a library team that will allow, for instance, access to the digital monograph. Uh, for instance, uh, for people who cannot see, how can we make a uh, work which is so much focused on visual <laughs> perception, etc., accessible for for people who have, you know, uh, you know, different uh, able people, as uh, as we say, you know, so and that we're trying to do that, and we're trying to do. Of course, it's going to be a textual type. We we'll use some techniques, the most advanced description, textual descriptions of the, of what you supposed to see and and experiment. But that's a big big challenge, a challenge that certainly uh, a single scholar cannot <clears throat> cannot. Uh, meet i mean uh, you know i i in in short answer to your question uh a, a digital monograph the all forms of uh, born digital publications are uh collaborative uh team efforts there is no question about different expertise different uh, who owns the rights uh who owns the rights well uh that's a very interesting question Recently, we signed a contract between me, Brown, and Stanford University Press. The press will provide the imprint, you know, the official imprint. Stanford University Press, which has a, co a collection of a digital monographs already uh, well established, will provide the, uh, the you know, the, 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 let's say the, uh, the, basically the official uh, uh, imprint of this but of course the uh, as an author as an individual author 
I had to release my rights to the li Brown Library, which is the effective producer. Okay, so I'm the author. The producer in the contract is going to be Brown University. The contract is effectively is going to be between Brown University and Stanford University Press. Uh, I won't see any royalties because this was already expensive enough to produce that uh, you know brown made an investment at this and this is going to be open access so no you want uh, you will be able to access this without paying for it you know uh, or at least this is something that i hope uh, will happen the stanford won't charge you for this uh, so it's a very interesting new business model you know also for publishing that uh, so um uh, I, there are other questions. I don't know if this uh, this answers the question. Hello from Nottingham. This is still Magdalena. Does it take much longer to produce? Well, I've been working on this for three, four years, and uh, the book was written, uh, and I had to rewrite it several times to adapt. You know, as the simulations were coming along, etc. Uh, as I try to explain, but uh, you know, it will it it took about uh, it will take about uh, four years to to produce, which is you know. Some, some books take longer, you know, clearly to, to, to be published. Uh, but the, this includes the research and includes also all the aspects of the design, etc. Uh, I have another question from Angelo Riccioni. He says, um, I was wondering if you consider studying also some kind of late 19th century jewels too, such as Stanhope pendants and stick pins. They were used, used by late Victorian people and they featured Painted lenses, yes, as in Magic Lantern lens slides to show, to show famous landscapes and landmarks. Of course, you know, I mean, the, the, my uh, survey of, uh, of, uh, of, you know, visual uh, forms, analog visual forms, and, uh, you know, studied as a sort of a foreshadowing uh, digital hour. It's limited to main, uh, you know, to mainstream, let's say, you know, there's things that, uh, uh, but there are so many examples, you know, there are so many examples and some are mentioned in the, not the, the, the dependence and stick things or the cameos or so on. I mean, there are so many examples of this miniaturization of, uh, of, um, of landscapes and, uh, and uh, you know, and the, the fact that uh, you know, uh, Monili and jewels could be used also as a portable, <laughs> as portable uh, visual gadgets to some extent. So I won't go into too much into this. But uh, uh, as far as the chat uh, is concerned, uh, those are all the questions I see for now. I don't know if I I answered them all, but it looks to me like. Um, Any other questions or comments from anyone? Just use the chat or use your microphone. Uh, can I ask just a very quick question? I was wondering uh, um, about, about the, the, um, the affordances of the digital format, because it allows uh, technically for a text to be accessed also in different languages provided that it is translated. So is that a, an issue that you have considered that of, of having it translated, like taking a, on, on the team, uh, maybe a translator and uh, having uh, making it available in different languages or uh, did you just assume that uh, since it is in English, uh, that could perfectly work as a lingua franca of, uh, let's say for a, an international readership. Well, of course, since I teach in the States and this was, uh, you know, a venture uh, here specifically designed for, uh, you know, for, um, to promote, uh, uh, you know, scholarly publication, a new uh, kind of scholarly publication within the American system in particular. Um, 
I, of course, I had to write in English, I, you know, and uh, so all the primary sources are translated, as I said, but uh, yes, I'm, I hope that uh, I, I'd be able to produce uh, an Italian translation, for instance, uh, of the whole thing, if there is a publisher maybe interested in, in working on a, on a vision. Of course, this, uh, this entire, you know, the, the contract, like for a regular book, uh, uh, you know, uh, assigns uh, uh, royalties, etc., to the publishing house. So this will be done, or should be done, if any translation comes up, uh, uh, any possible translation will be done in, in in concert with the with Stanford University Press. You know, I mean, if I, and this is not true only of translation, but also of derivative works. Because, for instance, uh, uh, the simulation, something I should have said during the later, uh, the simulations uh, are uh, a compromise. I don't know if this was clear to some extent. I mean, I had to produce uh, uh, 3D simulations uh, of, uh, of these experiences adapted to a 2D format, you know, a, a reading format, which is, uh, you know, the screen. This, this is clearly adaptation for the screen, Unity. But the simulation can be experienced, the simulation we produce can be experienced in a different way, you know, with visors, etc. So they could be real three-dimensional experiences. So they cannot be packaged with a book as such, or at least we haven't, uh, we haven't considered that for now. Uh, I keep calling it a book, you know, because <laughs> it is still a transitional form between book and, but, but of course there could be derivative uh, works, you know, not only translation, translation also in the sense of uh, uh, installations based on the simulation in museums and galleries, etc. that uh, sort of, so pieces of the book, some of the case studies could be also reconceived, retooled, uh, reconfigured as, uh, as uh, you know, uh, exhibits as uh, as something that. Uh, uh, so I mean, there are many possibilities. And translation, of course, I am, you know, I teach Italian studies in the United States, so I'm uh, keenly aware of the uh, problem of translating everything to English and making of English necessarily the lingua franca <laughs> for everything we do, and dealing with uh, with Italian uh, sources, Italian uh, uh, historical. Uh, artifacts, etc. It's even more, uh, you know, the effort is already made by me is translated into, into, you know, in the text, etc. to make sense. But, but translation is certainly a broader concept, in, you know, when we talk about uh, this, this format, so, you know, it has to also to, because, uh, you know, um, the evolution of, of technological tools and conceivably of scholarly forms uh, will continue. This is a first stage of, yeah, we are in a very early stage. So we have all to be in, engaged in this kind of translation, which is, uh, you know, at multiple level, linguistic, uh, cognitive, uh, you know, etc. So, uh, so this is very much part of, uh, of the experience that uh, I, but yes, I hope to be able to share <laughs> Uh, the the whole uh, uh, the, the whole monograph in at least in Italian. You know. I've, I've, we're talking about in Chinese. There is a possibility in Chinese, which is very interesting already. And I certainly uh, we would need some good translator would uh, would understand also the 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 style and uh, and the way that this is written in function also of its visual apparatus. Thank, Thank you for you. the question. Thanks. Any other question or comment? Well, if not, I think we've <laughs> used Massimo's time quite a lot and, and we, we've really received a lot. So we have to thank him again and really look forward to seeing you in Modena, hopefully if the world <laughs> starts working again. Um, at the summer school next year. Great, thank you very much. And actually, I, I hope to be to be able to show the final, final 
product maybe at that time we can do a third a third installment of my, the that history of this project <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much for inviting me and, uh, and uh, delightful you. to be with you friend. <laughs> thanks thank a lot you. thank you bye <laughs> bye 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 everyone Bye.